All right, who's excited for part four? The Holy Spirit P. <laughs> Powers the Christian lives, the, the Christian life. The Holy Spirit N. Neutralizes sin's power. The Holy Spirit E. There you go. The Holy Spirit U. Unifies and diversifies the church. And now on to our final two letters. The Holy Spirit M. Makes new hearts to inhabit. The Spirit's divine act of making new hearts is called regeneration or palingenesia in Greek. Uh, it's basically, you hear the language of born again. That's what this word means. Uh, palin, again, genesis, beginning, birth. Uh, you have been born again. You have been regenerated. Uh, what does that fancy theological word mean? Well, here's a great definition, again, from uh, the great J.I. Packer. It is the spiritual change wrought in the heart of man by the Holy Spirit in which his or her inherently sinful nature is changed so that he or she can respond to God in faith and live in accordance with his will. It extends to the whole nature of man, altering his governing disposition, illuminating his mind, freeing his will, and renewing his nature. So there you have a fancy theological definition out of a theological dictionary, but the truth is, you guys know this by experience. Amen? You have been regenerated. You have been born again. You have been raised from being a spiritual corpse into spiritual life. If you have any inkling of love for Jesus or trust in Jesus or worship of the Father, that is all thanks to the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit in you. You see this in Titus 3, verse 5. Who's going to read for me? Nice and loud for us, Daniel. Awesome. So this passage highlights that regeneration is spirit-initiated, not a response to our spiritual performance. Again, God didn't look down at you, and he was so dazzled by your performance and so dazzled by your holiness, he just had to recruit you for Team Jesus. That's not the way it worked. Uh, in John 3, we read that no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and born of the Spirit. So regeneration here is pictured, is pictured as spiritual birth. It's essential to be a living citizen in the new covenant kingdom. Just like Titus 3, 5, the emphasis is that regeneration is an exclusively God-initiated act. And then in John 3, the wind-spirit analogy of verse 8 points to the, our extreme difficulty in understanding the sovereign movements of the Spirit in bringing hearts to life. And so in that famous scene with Jesus and Nicodemus, uh, where you hear John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. It's in that same conversation that Jesus introduces the doctrine of regeneration, of new birth. He tells Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. And Nicodemus is scratching his head. What are you talking about? How can you be born again? You know, are you going to hop back in the womb? How does that work? And Jesus clarifies, I'm talking about spiritual rebirth. And he goes on to give this image. He says, the spirit is like the wind, which we've had plenty of today. Thank God I couldn't have tolerated 102 degree heat without that breeze. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, the wind, you don't know where it's coming from. You don't know where it's headed to. And the point of Jesus' metaphor, the wind metaphor for the Holy Spirit, is that the Holy Spirit's regenerating work is mysterious. You can't break it down into an algorithm. You can't break it down into a formula. You, you just have no idea uh, what the Holy Spirit is up to in people's hearts. And I've seen people saved in the most just unexpected ways. Uh, I already mentioned some of those die-hard, belligerent, atheist students that if you just looked at them, he said, nope, there's not a snowball's chance in hell that person's bound the knee to Jesus. And the wind of the Spirit blew on their hearts and blew away their resistance, and they bowed the knee to Jesus. Right? I've, I've seen this 
uh, over and over in years of ministry. I had a, a Mormon sitting in my living room uh, not too long ago. And somehow the conversation turned towards pornography. And he just kind of barfed all his issues on me and said, look, all the elders at my church are just coming down hard on me. They're telling me to just, just try harder to get to the bottom of this, to, to deal with it in my own power. And I just keep falling over and over and over and over again. And so I just laid out the gospel. I just laid out, his name is Chris. I said, Chris, you aren't saved by your power to not look at porn. The only way to be saved and secured and assured of your eternal destiny is by trusting in the perfect righteousness of Jesus. Now, I had no idea when Chris knocked on my door that day that we'd be having this conversation. But the mysterious wind of the Spirit blew him to my doorstep and led the conversation this way. And right after I shared it, after explaining it for like five minutes, Chris says, I want that. I want Jesus. I want grace. I want the gospel. I've been lied to. The Mormon church has lied to me. It's a guilt trip. I want grace. I want the gospel. And <laughs> in my thick-headedness, my response was, yeah, 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 that's great. But I really want to show you what Paul says in Ephesians 1. Look how he unpacks the gospel here. And he's like, uh-huh, okay, I get it. And, and then look at Romans 3. He's like, okay, I get it. I want that. Oh, but did I talk about Romans 8 yet? I got to go through Romans 8. And let's walk through Isaiah 53. And he's just like, yep, I get it, I get it, I get it. Until finally my wife peeked her head out from around the corner and was like, shut up. Just pray with the guy. Uh, so I had the... Uh, remember Istanbul? Oh, in Nepal. Yeah, yeah, same thing. Same thing. Holy Spirit just blows this waiter to our table, and there he is. And 10 minutes later, he's redeemed. And it was me again trying to be the Holy Spirit. Let me do this, this, and explain it. And the Spirit's just like, dude, shut up. I got this. He's regenerate. Just pray. <laughs> um, so I had the honor of praying with, with Chris, the now ex-Mormon, uh, right there in my living room. And so sometimes... The Holy Spirit's regenerating work is pretty instantaneous. That's how I experienced it at 14. You know, being raised Mormon, my parents left the Mormon church. I went through the motions, could recite all the verses. I knew my John 3.16. I had been a good Awana. I had earned all my sparky bucks, but none of it was real to me until February night when I'm 14 years old and I'm in a pit of depression and despair. And I had no idea that the Holy Spirit was going to blow that night and blow me into Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, where this bald guy would be rambling out of the Bible, Gray Glory, and preaching the good news I had heard and could recite for you, like the back of my hand. I knew the gospel. Again, I earned all the sparky bucks. But that night, what was different was I was actually hearing it for the first time. For the first time, the Holy Spirit had actually flipped the on switch in my heart. I had been regenerated. I did not walk into that church smarter than the day before. I didn't walk into that church more spiritual than the day before. I walked into that church just as dead to the things of God as I had been the 14 years prior. The only difference was the regenerating work of the Spirit. So for me, it was kind of in a snap. I've been in ministry long enough to see how the Holy Spirit will sometimes take his time. And so the regeneration for some of my dear friends, I, I have probably one of my best friends, Aaron, his regeneration, I would say, was the process of about seven years. Seven years from the time I saw the first stirrings of the Spirit in his life to the time he was standing in a cornfield in Hollister farming, uh, and it finally all clicked, and he texted me, oh yeah, I'm saved. <laughs> six years, six or seven years, that process. Uh, so don't get discouraged if there's somebody like, oh, I just want them saved so bad, and the Holy Spirit's just taking his time. Uh, sometimes the Spirit in his sovereignty takes time. So here's, uh, in, in the words of Francis Turretin, the great uh, theologian out of the 17th century. He says, God infuses his vivifying spirit 
who gliding into the inmost recesses of the soul reforms the mind itself, healing its depraved inclinations and prejudices. Now again, that's not just some wordy sentence from an old dusty theology book. That's something you guys have lived. God has infused his vivifying spirit in you. God has put himself in the inmost recesses of your soul. He's reformed your mind uh, and healed your depraved inclinations and prejudices. Which leads to our second big point here. The Holy Spirit not only regenerates, but also inhabits our hearts. The Holy Spirit not only regenerates, but also inhabits our hearts with greater intimacy greater flesh-mortifying and love-producing power than anything experienced by Old Covenant believers. J just think about that for a second. In the Old Testament, Moses is parting seas, right? He's turning staffs into snakes and back again. He's hitting a rock with a staff and water gushes out. We, we elevate these guys like, oh man, they're these spiritual superheroes. But the truth is, because we are new covenant believers, because Jesus came, died, rose, sent his spirit, we now have more instant access, more indwelling power of the Holy Spirit than anything Moses ever dreamed of. Isn't that good news? Yeah. So a big point here, the spirit's heart regenerating and inhabiting work is absolutely crucial because without this divine act, our hearts remain spiritually dead to the things of God, and our religion reduces to just doomed self-help efforts, uh, doomed self-help efforts of the sarks or of the flesh. Uh, in the words of R.A. Torrey, one of my theological heroes, he says, I can think of no thought more humbling and more overwhelming than the thought that the person of divine majesty and glory dwells in my heart and is ready to use even me. Personalize that for a second. Just take a second to kind of chew on that, that juicy morsel of truth. That a person of divine majesty and glory dwells in your heart and is ready to use even you. Amen? All right, so let's take that thought one step further. What difference does it make to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit? We got some fancy graphics for you here. Uh, without the Holy Spirit, there is no one infinite enough, that's your next blank, infinite. Without the Holy Spirit, there's no one infinite enough to make us integrated men. So we're left trying to construct our identity from what I call finite particulars. So here's the point I'm getting at here. If you look at that list, there's all these finite particulars of your life. We could go around under the tent here and talk about, you know, what are, what's your amount of income? What are your hobbies? What do you do for fun? Uh, what's your level of athletic skill? Uh, what did you major in in college? What's your family like? Uh, your religious performance? What are your past traumas? We could just go and have a major therapy session and share all the particulars of our life. But here's my question. Which one of those particulars of your life is the real you? Which one of those particulars of your life is your core unchangeable identity? And here's the problem. If you zero in on any of those and try to make that the foundation of who you are, everything else is going to spin into chaos and come crumbling down. Th think about it. If you've made a career the end-all, be-all of your identity, then you aren't going to be very secure. You're only going to be feeling okay when your career's doing great, but there's a career setback, and your whole identity topples down like a house of cards. You make romantic relationships the end-all, be-all. And again, that just isn't big enough to form an identity. Think of an illustration I used here like three years ago, how the solar system works, right? We have the sun at the center that's big enough. It's got enough gravitas. It's got enough glow to keep all the planets on their proper orbits. But what would happen if Pluto was so bent out of shape that it was stripped of planetary status, right? Pluto, I grew up, Pluto was a planet, not anymore, right? What if Pluto was so bitter it tried to take over the solar system? 
And now instead of a sun-centered, a heliocentric system, we're in a Pluto-centric system. Well, the problem is Pluto's too darn small. It doesn't have the heat the sun has. It's covered three quarters in frozen nitrogen. And it's about the quarter of the size of Earth, so it doesn't have the mass like the sun to keep everything in orbit. So everything would spin into chaos in a Pluto-centric system. The same happens to us as men when we put anything other than the Holy Spirit at the center of our identity. If you make your job, if you make your family, if you make your identity as a husband, if you even make your identity as a, as a churchman, any of these other identities other than the Holy Spirit, they aren't big enough to keep the other parts of you in proper orbit, so your life tends to spin and go haywire. So the question I write here is, where is the real you in all the particulars above? All these factors are finite, and therefore no single particular is big enough to bring integration ultimate meaning and order to the others. Although a mantra of our culture is the answers are within, we talked about this on Sunday a little bit, when we look really hard within, we find nothing big enough in and of ourselves to answer the ultimate who am I question. Only failed attempts to find meaning in particulars and the resulting internal chaos. Now the sec second graphic here highlights what the quest for identity looks like when it's centered on the spirit. You see the Holy Spirit right there in the center. He's not a finite particular. He's an infinite universal. He's big enough to pull the rest of you into orbit. So with the Holy Spirit indwelling you, you have someone inside of you who's not just another finite particular. You have an infinite universal, the fully divine and personal Holy Spirit, who's big enough to bring integration, ultimate meaning, and order to all the finite particulars of your identity. The answer is indeed within, if by the answer we mean the third person of the Trinity, who, as Jesus says, dwells with you and will be in you. Amen? Amen. All right, let's move on to... The final letter of our pneuma acrostic. But first, we're going to make sure we're all on the same page. The Holy Spirit, P, powers the Christian life. The Holy Spirit, N, neutralizes sin's power. The Holy Spirit, E, enlightens minds to God's truth. The Holy Spirit, U, unifies and diversifies the church. The Holy Spirit, M, makes new hearts to inhabit. And last but not least, the Holy Spirit, A, assures our destinies. The Holy Spirit objectively assures our destiny by forming the seal and guarantee that the completion of our salvation will actually happen. Objectively. The Holy Spirit objectively assures our destiny. What, do I, what am I getting at here? Well, in Ephesians 1, verses 13 to 14, can I get a volunteer to read it nice and loud for us? Go ahead, Bill. Awesome. Thank you so much. I want to zoom in on just one of the Greek words here in English. It's guarantee. In Greek, it's the word erebon. It's a legal term, and it means the first installment, the deposit, the down payment, and pledge, which represents a payment which obligates the contracting party to make further payments. That's one of Scripture's titles for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is your erebon, your deposit your guarantee. So when you first trusted Jesus, the Holy Spirit was given to you, took up residence in your heart, and that is God the Father's deposit, his pledge that he will deliver on your full inheritance. The Holy Spirit can't be ripped out of you. The pledge can't be taken back. The, the deposit can't be refunded. So once you're inhabited by the Holy Spirit, that actually... Uh, in a sense, it's a contract from God the Father that he will deliver on your full salvation. You see this, uh, a second related point is that the Holy Spirit subjectively assures our destiny by giving believers an internal awareness and confidence that they are indeed saved. 
So the first point, the Holy Spirit objectively, meaning in reality, you are signed and sealed, secure because of the indwelling spirit. Your destiny is sure. Now I say objectively because that remains true of you whether you feel like it or not. If you trust Jesus, and in John 6, Jesus says, all who come to me, uh, all who come to me were given to me by the Father. And then he says in verse 44, he says, and I will raise him up on the last day. All who are given to me, uh, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. We can't defund it, right? What's that? We can't defund it, right? Yeah, we can't defund it. Yeah, you can't defund the Holy Spirit. Yeah, you can't abolish uh, the sovereign work of God here. Yeah, good point. So there will be days that you don't feel like that is true. There will be Days that you are oblivious to your eternal destiny. But thanks to the work of the Holy Spirit, that doesn't alter your eternal destiny one iota. You are just as signed, just as sealed, just as secure as ever, even when you don't feel it. But the Spirit also subjectively assures our destiny. Uh, Romans 8, 16 says, The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirits, that we are children of God. There's something to be said about uh, what sometimes is called the self-authenticating witness of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and this is a point uh, Larry brought up in, in the last session. You know, how do we know that the Bible is spirit-inspired? And your answer was, I know it because he changed my life. I've experienced him. I don't think about the Holy Spirit the way I think about a math equation. I've experienced his regenerating power, right? And so that gives you the subjective assurance that you are, in fact, a child of God. You see this echoed in 1 John. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know by the Spirit he gave us. We know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us his Spirit. Now watch this. John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you might hope, so that you might cross your fingers, so that you might hope on a distant star that maybe, just maybe. No, I write these things to you who believe in the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. You can know that you know that you know you're saved thanks to the assuring work of the Spirit. And, and let me just set this in a cultural context for a second. Right now, feels like to many people the apocalypse, right? You, you guys see some of these memes that pop up? Where it's like, oh, great, now we got murder hornets. And it's like bingo. It's coronavirus bingo. And if you guess which catastrophe is coming next, you know, you get a point. Um, like, who had murder hornets coming in June? Um, or who had, you know, fill in the blank. And I have an awful lot of uh, non-Christian friends uh, that I'm pretty close to and that I, I see their posts, you know, in my news feed every day. And I got to tell you, the level of catastrophic thinking, the level of it's the end of the world, the level of the sky is falling down is so sad. It's so sad. Because think about it. We can very easily as Christians, you hear this kind of stuff regularly, so you can sort of get numb to it. It sort of becomes a little bit cliche. Maybe you get a little bit, bit cynical about it. But just step out of that with your imagination for a second and imagine if the Holy Spirit didn't assure your destiny. If heaven wasn't guaranteed through your arabone, your, your deposit, your pledge, your down payment. You should look at those headlines and scream your head off in terror and go running into the hills to buy guns and gold, Right? Without the assurance of the Holy Spirit, I, I can fully understand some of my atheist friends why they look at something like global warming and it's this catastrophic end of the world scenario and unless we radically change everything in the next five years, we're all going to die. 
If you don't have the assurance of the Holy Spirit, what do you have when you look into the future? Nothing but fear and uncertainty. No guarantees, right? And it gets catastrophized with politics. If I have a lot of my non-Christian friends who are saying, you know, if, if Trump wins in November, the whole world's going to explode. We're all going to spontaneously combust and it's going to be Nazism 2.0. And, and there's that fear that, that drives them. And, and I just wanted to walk you through that to say as Christians, you should be countercultural. There's so much fear pervading our society. Let the Holy Spirit give you a way of saying, look, come hell or high water, should the mountains tumble to the sea, should the earth spontaneously combust, I'm good. I'm, I'm square with God. I'm secured. I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit. Amen? All right, so let's, let's wrap that up. The, the destiny-assuring work of the Holy Spirit is so important because without it, we would be haunted by ongoing uncertainty about our eternities, propelling us into either despair or fear-based religious acts. But because the Holy Spirit assures our destiny, we're able to practice gratitude rather than fear-based acts of goodness. There is a world of difference between serving people out of fear, am I under the wrath of God, is he gonna strike me you know, with a lightning bolt? Uh, there's a qualitative difference between serving people out of fear where it's really about you and serving people out of gratitude where you just realize I'm saved by grace, I am sealed in the spirit by grace, I know where I'm headed then it frees you up. You aren't trying to prove anything when you serve others. There's, there's something about trying to prove yourself that the Spirit just sets you free from. So let's uh, move on to... Oh, <laughs> number three. Yes, how did I skip that? The Holy Spirit himself will be the active divine agent in resurrecting our bodies. You get a brand new resurrection body, which in my case is good news. This is our great hope in a death and disease ridden world. And so the Holy Spirit is concerned with all of you, loves all of you, redeems all of you. And so in a lot of American Christianity in particular, there's a revival of an old heresy called Gnosticism. And for the Gnostics, the idea was that all that really matters is the spirit world. And so the goal of Christianity is just to sort of float off into the clouds after you die. That's the goal, to, to strum, air harp, and wear a white dress on a cloud. Biblical Christianity is much more embodied than that. God saves your soul, yes, but he also is in the process of redeeming all of you, which includes your body. Jesus saves the whole man. And so that's important because, again, there's a lot of super spiritual Christianity. But let me, let me say it like this. If God only wanted to save your soul, there's no reason for Easter. There is no reason for that tomb to be empty. The tomb was empty because Jesus didn't rise as a vapor. He didn't rise as a hologram. He didn't rise as a ghost. He rose bodily. He rose physically. The body that went into the grave walked out of the grave Easter Sunday. And so in the same way, there will be a one-to-one -one correspondence between your body that dies and the one that God resurrects. And so, again, we are not Gnostics. We celebrate the fact that God saves the whole person, body and soul. And so let's flip to our conclusion here. The Holy Spirit gives us new hearts and takes up residence inside of us. One of his primary works in our hearts is to give us unshaking confidence of our eternal destiny so that we are less plagued by fear, stress, and uncertainty. So here's a community question I want to flip your way. We've talked about regeneration, how the Holy Spirit uh, brings people from spiritual death to spiritual life. It's a simple question. Think of three people three specific people you would love to see the Holy Spirit regenerate. Three people and list their names below. And then uh, we're going to pray for those people by name 
Here we've, we've learned for the last seven hours that the Holy Spirit is sovereign. Now we're going to pray as if he's actually as sovereign as scripture says, because he is. And so we're going to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to do his heart regenerating work. So go ahead. I'm going to give you 60 seconds. Uh, write down three names. And if you get to three and you're like, oh, man, I got like 10 more, feel free to, to add a few to the list. All right, let's do this. Um, instead of just praying at your table for this, let's just pray as a giant group. And so I'm going to ring, and Tim, you mind hanging up? Closing out the prayer? I ring, you hang up. Yeah. And, and so in between, um, just you don't have to pray some big elaborate, we beseecheth thee from on high. That You, you can just shout out the name. You could just say, God, save X, Y, and Z. And it's just going to be a time for us as men of Riverview to, to lift up these people that we care about, that we want to see enjoy God like we do. Um, so I'll start, and in that space in between me and Tim closing, um, just, just throw out those names for the Holy Spirit to do his heart regenerating work. Holy Spirit, we thank you for spiritual life. Without you, um, we would be oblivious to our creator. We would just be bowing down to, to money or sex or whatever rush we could find. But thanks to you, Holy Spirit, you have jolted spiritual life into us. And we want, we want everybody to experience that. And so we just want to lift up some names of people we really care about, trusting that you are in fact sovereign enough to answer this prayer. And so, God, I just want to lift up uh, my brother, Damon, uh, who has walked away from you for, I'd say, the last 30 years. Would you save him? I pray for my brother-in-law, Brian, who has a whole lot of ego in the way of him bowing the knee. Would you overcome that pride and bring him to salvation? And Lord, I pray for my, uh, my brother Greg, who is deeply atheist and prideful about it. Would you break down that pride and save Greg? So I lift up Brian, I lift up Damon, I lift up Greg. Would you change their hearts? final page in your workbook, as we wrap up here, all together, you have no excuse to not shout it out. It's literally printed right in front of you. The Holy Spirit, P, powers the Christian life. The Holy Spirit, N, neutralizes sin's power. The Spirit, U, unifies and diversifies the church. The Holy Spirit, E, lightens minds to God's truth. The Holy Spirit, M, hearts to inhabit, and the Holy Spirit, A, assures our destiny. So we end where we began. The intentional Christian man 
is a man of power, a man no longer dominated by indwelling sin, a gifted man who serves his community, who knows God's truth revealed in Scripture, a man with a new heart filled with a spirit who has surefire confidence where he is going. Amen? Amen? In short, to be an intentional Christian man is to be a Holy Spirit-powered man.